nutrition ever since. So yeah, ruminant nutrition for the past 35 years or so. So tonight's talk's entitled Feed Analysis. Why do we do it? How do we do it? What and how do we utilize the results? So just as via an introduction here, we know that forages are the main component of beef cattle diets in, in Alberta. Uh, everybody will know that. I always like to put the next statement in more, more so for like, you guess the crowd that thinks that cows are just cow farts and methane production, but they forget that cattle are very good at turning poor quality nutrients, so meaning nutrients that aren't good for us, into high quality nutrients that are good for us, and that's of course in the form of meat and milk. And we know that cattle rely on forages to supply energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. This is what I what I call a, a perspective slide, like. Any time or most times when we get feed analysis back, the first question people ask you, well, what's the protein content? So I always put this slide up just to give you an idea of the relative requirements of a beef cow. We can see by far and away the most 84% uh, of our requirements are actual energy. So that's why I'm going to talk about energy being the most important nutrient and focusing more on that on, on feed samples. It's not saying that protein and minerals and vitamins isn't important, it's just pro energy is the, the main one. Uh, why do we do feed analysis? Well, the feed analysis is just simply a, a process of determining what, what nutrients are in a feedstuff. We do this because we wanna know how closely a feed will balance the requirements of a particular animal given the goals of the program. We do feed analysis because we want to avoid surprises and surprises we can have are like such things as skinny cows that leads to poor fertility, fat cows that you can have uh, calving problems. You can have dead cows with an imbalance or weak calves, poor performance on calves. And th the main thing to know is that cattle diets are very similar every day, right? Like they eat similar diets every day. There's not a lot of change in them. So if that's the case and we, it's not nutritionally balanced, we know deficiency will, will, will occur. So basically, we need to know what uh, what to supplement to balance the diet. Just a few things on how feed should be sampled. So I've got it broken down into bales, dry and wrap bales. Um, a core sample is the best way to go. So it's a probe that you take out of the center of the bale. You do about five or ten percent of the bales in a in a stack. You you pull the pro pull it and take a sample from that. You don't you don't want to just reach into a round bale and drag out drag out some, some hay because you'll lose the leaves and stuff when you do that. Um, for silage, whether it's pits, bunkers, piles, or bags, usually we're using a long probe and going from the top and prob probing down in four, four or five different spots, uh, taking a subsample of that and sending that off to the lab. Uh, just silage bags, you can do it from the side, that's fine. Often get the question, uh, fresh samples when chopping, should you do that or should you not do that? Um, the truth of it is that usually if the ensilum process is decent, there's not a lot of change from the fresh samples to the, to the ensiled samples. Mainly, mainly what happens is the, the sugar, sugar within the silage will be converted to, to lactic acid, the end product of silage fermentation. Uh, doing samples off the face is good too. Probably, probably more exciting when you're old like me and climbing up on piles is not such a good time. Uh, just a couple words on on swath grazing or corn grazing. The best way to do it is to take uh, some plants from various locations of the field and chop them up into small pieces and then send them off to the lab that way. Uh, so how to handle the samples, mix a representative as possible sample in a pail, subsample and put in the plastic bag. If it's wet, it needs to be frozen. If it's not getting to the lab within a couple of days, so you don't want to let it sitting around because it'll start to spoil. Uh, just uh, a couple of points on, there's different ways of testing feed. There, there's two, like the one's called wet chemistry, which is traditional laboratory methods. And the other one's called NIRS or near infrared reflectance spectrometry. So just two different ways of analyzing the sample. In wet chemistry, they use actual acids, detergents, solvents, 
uh, can even have cannulated cows, but basically it's, it's standard lab procedures in order to determine the value of a feed. And really it's, it's the gold sand standard for doing analysis on sample. NR is a little different. What NR is, is they basically, they, they pass a beam of light through the feed sample and different compounds within the sample reflect red light at a different wavelength. So you get a graph. And from that graph, you can compare it to a database of known graphs and determine the analysis that way. The thing you gotta know is that the, the database that you have has to be verified by a wet chemistry analysis. So the bigger the database, the closer to the sample that, that you're analyzing is, the more accurate the sample is. So the accuracy of, of NIR is dependent on the calibration, which is the number of samples that have been done in the past to compare it against. Uh, how accurate an analysis? Um, all analysis are subject to errors. You know, there, there's lab methods and techniques that are not perfect. So you're always gonna get a certain amount of error within the analysis. It's one of the reasons why we use a safety and margin in order to balance rations is because of that. Likely the biggest variable is actually the sampling technique. How representative is the sample of the feed being analyzed and ultimately fed? Uh, probably just the grabbing the hay out of the, grabbing a handful out of hay on, out of a bale is a classic example of it won't be that representative. Uh, just some pros and cons. So wet chemistry is really good accuracy on a representative sample. The con of it is, is it's time consuming and relatively expensive. It takes you quite a, a few days longer to get back the feed sample if it's been done wet chemistry. Uh, the good thing of NIR is the fast turnaround time and it's relatively inexpensive. Accuracy can be a problem. I sort of talked about it. Like if the sample being analyzed is not represented in the database, then it's not going to be that accurate. So just for an example, a lot of these poly crops now where you got oh, 14 or however many different species within the crop, the possibility of the lab having a database that's related to that sample is pretty remote. So that would be one sample that we prefer to do at wet chemistry analysis. Uh, these are just some places to send, send samples out to if you're interested. That's some of them that's not an exhausting list, but it gives you an idea of where we can send them and get them analyzed. So this, this is just, you've probably seen one of these before. This is just a, a report on a feed sample and you can see there's a bunch of different nutrients and different acronyms on here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a few of them now and try to explain what they mean and what, what value they are. So the first nutrient always of interest is dry matter or moisture content of the forage. Like when we balance rations, it's always on a dry matter basis. And basically that it just enables you to compare every forage on a fair, fair value. Um, we care about moisture, whether it's too wet or too dry, basically, right? With hay, we know if it's too wet, it won't keep. Uh, silage, if it's too wet, it'll undergo a, a different fermentation that doesn't give you the best, the best in silent process. It's called the butyric acid fermentation. Um, too dry of silage, oftentimes it's, it's difficult to pack and get the oxygen out, so you don't really get a, get a good fermentation on that one either. <clears throat> so how, how do we determine energy in, in a feed sample? And the energy is determined by, by two, two um, measures of fiber. The first one's called acid detergent fiber, or the abbreviation on it on the test will be ADF. And basically what acid detergent fiber is, is what fiber will digest, or actually the, the test is not. So the number that comes back says that that's the amount of fiber in the sample that will not digest in an acid, in an acid system. And basically what an acid system is would be like the stomach, the regular stomach of the cow. Neutral detergent fiber, NDF, is, is the fiber that won't, won't digest under a neutral system or simulate in the rumen, so stuff around pH seven. So neutral detergent fiber, what it says that's not digestible within the rumen. Acid detergent fiber, what it says is not digestible pretty much period throughout the whole animal. 
So the reported values are what not is what is not digested. So higher energy, higher values. So meaning higher ADF or higher NDF values mean that the lower quality forage or a lower energy value forage. All the all the different um, energy values that are reported on, such as total digestible nutrients, digestible energy, metabolized and all, net energy of, main, of maintenance, net energy of gain, net energy of lactation. They're all they're all equations derived off of the acid detergent fiber value. So basically, way back when the first one calculated was total digestible nutrients or digestible energy. From there, they've just added more equations, thinking what else goes on within the animal. So metabolizable energy says what actually gets to the cells and that, and then net energy after the, the heat increment of feed and then the cost of going through the cells and that, that's what net energy is. But just to know that they're basically all, well, they all are equations based off of acid detergent fiber. So that, that's why we care about acid detergent fiber. Um, ADF and NDF are also used to calculate relative feed value on a forage. Originally, originally relative feed value was basically uh, an equation that was used for alfalfa to um, talk about how good alfalfa is or not. It was mainly done for the dairy market in the U.S., a, a higher relative feed value would be a higher, a higher quality alfalfa, and you could pay more money for it, or it would be priced at a higher level. The trouble with the relative feed value is it, it basically is just including ADF and NDF, of which if you look at if you look at alfalfa, will always be lower in NDF than something like a grass or a cereal. Cereals and grasses are always higher in NDF value. So consequently, within this calculation, the relative feed value of cereals would always be lower than alfalfa. But that's that's not true. We know we know there's some cereals, corn silage or good cereal silage that's higher energy value than corn or than alfalfa. So why is that? So that that's when they went to do the NDF digestibility. So it's the actual. It's how digestible the, the NDF is and also the rate of digestibility of the NDF within the forage the rate of digestibility of NDF within the forage will determine how much a cow can eat because it passes out of her system quicker if it's if it's more digestible, so thus a higher energy value. So anyway, when you when you put NDF digestibility into the equation and use that, that that's where they get this relative feed quality from. And you'll see relative feed quality values will be quite a bit higher on a lot of these good quality cereal silages and corn silage. So really relative feed quality is what what one we're looking at now. So protein on on the on the feed analysis, we look at crude protein, and basically you got to look at protein in the context of what the requirements are. Right? We know that smaller size, faster growth, or lactation all require higher protein levels within the animal. So you evaluate a forage based on what the requirements of the animal are. When they're small, growing fast. Or milking, then then you need higher protein content. We we also break it down a little bit further than that. We we look at rumen degradable protein, and then we break it into what's called true protein or amino acids, and then non-protein nitrogen. The reason we do that is because there's there's bacteria within the rumen that actually have a requirement for the protein, the true protein, and then there's bacteria within the rumen that have a requirement for just ammonia or non-protein nitrogen. So. That's that's why we like to look at them to see what the balance of them two are for the for the for the rumen bacteria. Um, we also look at rumen undegradable type protein, and you'll you'll see this either expressed as NDIN, which is neutral detergent insoluble nitrogen, or it'll be neutral detergent insoluble protein. Basically, it's saying what what is not digestible, what's within the neutral detergent fiber of it going to be digestible. So basically it's telling you what the, what the bypass value is of the protein, what protein bypasses the rumen and goes into the, into the small intestine. There's another measure of protein called acid detergent insoluble nitrogen, or, or it'll be expressed as ADIP as well, so insoluble protein. And basically it's an indication of the protein that's within the acid detergent fiber that's not going to be digestible at all. It's also known as heat damaged protein, or there's a technical term called the Mallard reaction. So basically the protein reacts with the carbohydrates and forms a compound that's not digestible. 
Uh, so black, black silages that'll test 20% protein, but they're black because they've heated. Well, that'll, that'll be a really high level of ADIN. And of course we have to adjust for that when we're, when we're making rations because we know that protein's not available to the cow. Uh, just a few words on minerals. So these are, these are the main macro minerals and all macro means is required in larger amounts. Most of these we're looking at, you know, we're worried if the levels are short, like calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, for example. Some of them we're looking at the levels to make sure they're not too high. Potassium would be one prime example. And that if we know if we get too high of potassium levels in forage, it, it interferes with calcium and uh, magnesium and you end up with um, winter tetany in cows is probably the classic sign when the potassium gets too high and you haven't got enough calcium and magnesium. Sulfur is another one that we'll look at, and it's mainly from a derogatory standpoint that high sulfur levels will, uh, it interferes with certain trace minerals like selenium, for example, or if it gets really high, you can get what's called polioencephalation in cattle, which is actually a thiamine deficiency. So they drop, they don't, they don't get up, but it's, it's actually sulfur that's causing it, too high of sulfur. Not, not a huge problem in cows usually, but we see it more in feedlot diets for sure. And more so that we're we're getting into more byproducts because lots of times byproducts like corn distillers, for example, will be quite high in sulfur because basically what they're doing is they're taking a, a product and concentrating up all the minerals about three times in it when they remove the starch from the product. Uh, these are the trace minerals or micro minerals, and it just simply means these are the minerals that cattle require in smaller amounts. And again, we, we look at it from a not enough standpoint, and that would be zinc, selenium, copper, manganese, iodine, and cobalt. We're worried about them not being enough, although selenium and cobalt, we really don't test for. We just add it, add it to the level we think is required. Uh, stuff like iron and molybdenum, we care if it's too much because then you'll start to get some interactions again. Iron's actually a pro-oxidant, so most most within the body we want antioxidants like vitamin e for example but if you got really high le iron levels you might need more of that and molybdenum is one that we know it it ties up uh, copper for it is the main one so if you got really high molybdenum levels in the forage then you have to have higher copper or maybe a different source of copper just need a drink here Uh, so just uh, just a few few words on vitamins. We never test for vitamins in in a forage of samples. It's it's just too too expensive to do. Um, just Cole's notes version. Green grass is a really good source of vitamins, so I I usually don't supplement vitamins on green grass. Uh, dry hay is an okay source. Um, it still retains some vitamins in it. Will deteriorate over time, so we do have to supplement. Uh, silage, all the vitamins and silage are actually destroyed, so that's where we need to supplement all the requirements for vitamins. Uh, just some interesting topics. I, I thought I'd talk about nitrates because that comes up every year. So what causes nitrates? So basically anything that stops photosynthesis within the plant causes nitrates to accumulate. So the top growing part of the plant stops growing. The roots continue to take up nitrogen in the form of nitrate and the plant doesn't convert it to protein. So that's how you get nitrates in plants, anything that stops photosynthesis. The one, the one exception to the nitrate rule is, is legumes, and the reason why is because the nitrogen is actually fixed in the roots, so it doesn't go into the plant in the form of nitrate. It comes up as, as actual nitrogen. <clears throat> what happens within the rumen? Well, nitrates are converted to nitrite, and nitrate is served into the bloodstream, it, it screws up hemoglobin. Basically, it competes with on hemoglobin for oxygen as a transport for it. And you get brown blood because it's not red, it's not carrying oxygen anymore. Uh, and of course, that results in poor performance lessnesses. And if it's bad enough, it, it, can, it can kill them, of course. Um, there's clinical and subclinical effects. So clinicals, obviously, you're going to know what's going on. It's it's not good. Subclinical just means that you might not really notice it, but it's it's affecting production. So how do you how do you manage nitrates? 
while the reason why they say cut immediately after the damage is because there's no time for the nitrates to, to accumulate. So that's the best method is to cut immediately after the damage. Um, you also hear, well, you wait for five days or a week before cutting. Well, that that's actually only true if the plant starts to grow again. So say it's uh, a drought and you get some rain or hail, but it's not that bad and it starts to grow again. In other words, it starts to photosynthesize again. Then it'll start to drop the nitrates down. <clears throat> if the plant's dead, it won't. And that, that's when you need to cut it right away. Uh, nutrient dense crops are the highest risk. So what, what I mean by that, so just for example, if you got some some oats that are really young that are on a, a, a field that had a high level of fertilization and you think the protein is going to be 16 or 17 or higher percent protein, <clears throat> that's where nitrates are the highest risk because it's it's a percent of the protein. And if the nitrates are high, then the amount of nitrates the animals are going to be getting are quite a bit higher too. The other thing to know, in silen will actually decrease the nit nitrate levels. So about 50% is what I understand. So if you've got a high nitrate forage in silen, it'll drop it by 50%. <clears throat> there's, there's various ways that the lab will actually report nitrates, and you have to be aware of how they're being reported. So there, there's three ways. There's percent NO3, which is the actual percent nitrate ion. and that's one way they can report it. They can do percent nitrate nitrogen is another way. And nitrogen, of course, is part of protein. So basically, protein is 6.25% nitrogen. So that, that's why the different levels there. And the last one is, is potassium nitrate. That's another way of reporting it. <clears throat> so just, just for a range of what's, what's OK and what could cause you problems, under, under the nitrate ion, if it's a half a percent nitrate, it's no problem. If it's a half to one caution, meaning uh, you might have to dilute it with something or, or just be aware that it's there. And then, of course, if it's 1% one, 1 or higher, then you then you got problems. Then you need to do some dilution on the feeder. You need to do something with it. And then the, the other ones are just, just other expressions. So nitrate, nitrogen, the number's 0.12, safe, 0.12 to 0.23, and then 0.23 or higher is bad. And then the uh, potassium nitrate over 1.63 is bad. Um, lots, of, lots of times they'll report it on, on the silage sample, not in percent, but as parts per million or milligrams per kilogram. So I'm just letting you know that 1% is 10,000 ppm. So if we, if we look at the nitrate nitrogen one here, if it's got 2,300 parts per ppms or milligrams per kilogram, that's bad. So just to be aware that there's different different ways of reporting it on the on the reports. A little bit on molds or microtoxins. They they can be really bad. Damaged crops contain more. So any any kind of plant energy plant injury leads to more microtoxins because there's more fungus species that'll get in there and attack them. The the safe saying is do not feed any moldy feed to cattle because you don't know what what'll go on with it. The interesting part is we know that large amounts of mold can have very little toxins, which is good. So you can have a very moldy crop, but the toxin level in it's pretty, pretty low. But the flip side of that one is you can have very little mold in it, but it can have a really high level of toxins. And obviously that's bad. So testing, you, you can test for mycotoxins. There's a few different ways of doing it. Mold count is just simply how, what, what mold's grown on the forage. ID will be the species grown on the forage, which the, from that you can extrapolate what the toxin may be, or you can do actually a mycotoxin screen on it. We'll tell you what, what the toxins are and what their levels are and give you some idea on, on how, how bad these toxins are because they're not, they're not all the same either. Whoops. Uh, what what to do for what to do for microtoxins? There's inhibitors and binders. The biggest one's probably management, where you you know if you're talking silage specifically, you um, put it up with the correct moisture content. You pack it as good as you can, or as compact as you can get, or you cover it as soon as you can. Basically, you're trying to do anything to get the fermentation process to go quick which is where silage inoculants come in. 
So you want you want the silage, you want the fermentation process to be quick, conserve the forage as quick as possible, and then you get less molds and mycotoxins in it. Propionic acid is just another. You can apply propionic acid to wetter type hay, and basically it it wipes out molds. It it's a mold inhibitor, so the molds won't grow on it. Within feed, usually we talk mycotoxin binders. There's various different ones and different feeding rates on them. But basically what they're made up of is, is clays or bentonites, zeolites, which is, and polysaccharides, which are all compounds that, that have an affinity to attract the microtoxins. They bind to them and flush them out of the system so the cow doesn't get them or the animal doesn't get them. They, they, they work, they work, but you, you kind of want to want to try and prevent the mycotoxins if you can. A uh, little bit on ergots. Er ergots probably one of the nastier, nastier funguses and problems that we can get in crops. Same deal, damaged crops have more because it's a parasitic fungus, so any opportunity it has to affect the plant at will. Standard statement, do not feed ergot to cattle. What, what ergot is, is it's actually a basal constrictor, which means that the blood vessels, it cuts them off. So that's why you see uh, usually tails or ears, something that hasn't got a big blood supply to it. You'll see the results there first, meaning that the blood will be cut off and you'll actually lose tails or lose ears. And performance obviously is not going to be good. Old rules used to be one kernel per thousand kernels, so 0.1% was thought to be safe, but we don't we don't really think that way anymore because it's kind of the same deal as the molds and microtoxins. You can have um, not a lot of ergot and lots of ergot alkaloids, which are the actual toxic compound within ergot or vice versa, you can have very little ergot, but lots of ergot alloys. Um, testing, you can do that as well. It's a little difficult to get accurate, accurate results from different labs because it depends, it depends a lot on the sample size and whether they're grinding the whole sample or what they're doing with it. I'm done. Do we have... Any yeah, is questions there any from questions? the audience? Jamie, when we're talking about mycotoxins, what are the different color of uh, molds that we're looking for and what do they possibly mean? Yeah, um, I'll have to rack my brain a little bit, but basically the white mold that's probably the most common is, is an aspergillus species. It's usually got some of the some of the tamest mycotoxins in it. Like I think there's one, uh, it's either vomitoxin. I think it's vomitoxin. You can get more of it, but the white the white mold is is the least the least problem. The the most problem one that I've ever ran into. It's actually kind of a a bright pink type mold, and it, it leads to it's it's called T two toxins, and they're 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 bad. I've, I've only seen it in a few corn silages over the years, but they're pretty low level, but they cause major, major performance disruption in a hurry. Mm -hmm. I could have went into more detail. There, there's, there's some other colors too, like there's some blue ones and some black ones, and but them are the two I can remember offhand, but not too bad and really bad. Thank you. Is there any other questions? You can either unmute yourself or type it into the chat if you have any. We'll just give you a couple seconds here. Yeah, any, any clarification? I probably went through it pretty fast. So if you need me to slow down on something or give clarification on something, that's, that's fine. Uh, Jamie, could you go back to the actual analysis itself and just, I don't know if you can with your laser pointer, and show which side, because it shows both sides of the feed analysis, like which one specifically are we looking at? Which ones do I care about most? Well, I'll just try and be okay on top there. Yeah, so this, this particular sample, the first one that I would look at is right on the left-hand side, NIR analysis. So we know it's done NIR, right? So we know that... It's 67.9% moisture and 32% dry matter. So typically silages, 
you sort of, you sort of, you don't want to get them any less than about 45 dry matter or they're too dry. And anything much over about 70% moisture is too wet and you'll get that weird fermentation that I was talking about. Not maybe so much in corn silage, but you'll, the, the shrink and the seepage on something that wet is humongous, right? You'll have it running all winter. So a lot, lots of dry matter losses doing that. Um, the next one I look at is crude protein. And just, just interestingly in corn silage, 9.4% crude protein on here. That's actually quite high for corn silage. So I automatically know that this one's probably, probably not as good on energy value or in starch value because really what happens within the kernel of corn itself, as that starch comes in, it lowers the protein of it. So I know this one just like typically corn will run seven, 8% protein. So I know this one's not quite as good. Um, the soluble or the ammonia protein, part of the, part of that's what I was talking about, different requirements within the, within the, within the room. And that, that number actually means a lot more on a higher protein haylage. So if you got a, like a 20% alfalfa silage, for example, and you got a really high ammonia level, that, that basically tells you that the fermentation wasn't very good, wasn't very quick. So it drug on for a while and you ended up with higher ammonia levels. What else do we got there? So that's what they mean. Uh, so the, the ADF protein, so that's the acid detergent insoluble nitrogen I was talking about. So 1% of the 9% is ADF, so bound protein that the animal is not going to be utilized. Now, typically within any forage, we know it's about 8% is the number. And in all the ration balancing programs we have, that's taken into account. That's already out of the equations. So 1 divided by 9.4. So this one says it's 10.6%. So basically, this one's pretty good, but it has got a little bit of heat damage in it because I know normal is 8% of that stuff. But overall, it's pretty good. The NDF, so that's the NDF protein or the bypass protein that I was talking about. So that, that more so, I don't, I don't really care in, in beef cattle because they haven't really got a, much of a bypass protein requirement. In dairy cows, I care more. So that, that's basically 20% bypass protein. I'd be using that in a computer bottle on dairy to determine how much bypass protein I'm adding into the diet. Beef cattle, it's really, really not a thing. Oh, what else do we got there? Oh, the rumen degradable. That, that's just simply the opposite of the bypass is all that is. So then the next ones of interest are, are the ADF. So acid detergent fiber, 24.4% of it, of the fiber portion. And the fiber portion is basically... Um, in this case, it'd be cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Uh, so 24.4% of that is not digestible in the stomach, basically, is what that says. Um, the ADF, there, there's two types of ADF here, or of NDF, I'm sorry. So the, the actual NDF is the proportion of NDF that is not digestible within the rumen. Just for, for interest's sake, both, both of them values are quite good. This is, this is quite a good forage. Uh, the the NDF organic matter just just means that they're removing some of the some of the minerals and stuff that are stuck within the NDF. So for predictability of intake and stuff, that that number is just a little bit more accurate than what the straight NDF is. But it's it's kind of grassman at straws. Lig lignin is actually the part of the part of the NDF that's not digestible at all. So higher lignin type forages, you know, they're not very digestible. It's also contained within the NDF and the NDF as far as the calculation, but we know for sure that that portion of the fiber is not, not digestible. The, the, the rest of them down below, like the NDF digestibility stuff, that, that's what I was talking about, how, you, how, how you're calculating um, relative, feed, relative feed quality as opposed to the relative forage value. The different, you notice in brackets, they got 12 hours, 24 hours, 30 hours. Basically, them numbers are talking about how long does the forage actually remain within the rumen. So the most meaningful one in, in, in dairy cows is the 30-hour one. So it tells you how digestible the NGF is within the rumen in a 30-hour time frame. Also, how long it stays in the rumen. When you get up into the higher hour stuff, it's basically telling you what 
what is not going to be digestible as well. It's just the opposite of what's digestible. Nowadays, we're using, it's basically that bottom number there is also the UNDF 240. We're, we're using that to try and predict intake on, on cows. But basically, it's, it's the same. You, you can do the same thing using NDF levels. A cow will only eat so much NDF per percent of body weight. Um, just skipping down to the carbohydrate section here. So ethanol, so, so basically this is sugar. And this is what I was talking about. On, on a fresh silage sample, that number will be quite a bit higher because a lot of that is what the bacteria is using in order to ensile a silage. So it'll probably be like five, five, six percent in fresh stuff. And it'll go down to the one percent after it's ensiled. Starch is starch, right? So that's that's how much grain or is actually actually in the forage. And just from a from a ruminant standpoint, starch is utilized more efficiently in what the fibers are, so it gives higher energy value. Uh, crude fat it, it factors into the into the energy as well. Um, corn is just simply higher in fat than what other things are, so that's why it's two point six seven. I can't really see the mineral side here, but the, the one thing that I <clears throat> notice on this sample is to notice it was NIR. The minerals were also done NIR. Doing minerals by NIR is actually quite useless because yet if you think about it, not only do you have to have the same kind of forage, you also have to have the same kind of soil type, the same kind of fertilizer type. I mean, for the database, right? To compare the sample against. So basically, if you do NIR on minerals, they're they're pretty useless. I can look at them and see whether they make sense or not, just relative to what type of crop it is. But if I really want to know what's in there, I'll do it with chemistry. Uh, what else do we got? Uh, pH, interesting on silage. It just tells you how the fermentation's gone. In order to stop the silage process, you want the pH on corn to about four is right. On haylage is about four and a half. TDN, NEG, them, them are just all the calculations I was talking about. It's just all equations based off of ADF and just different equations to try and make it more and more accurate. Non-fiber carbohydrate, that just means um, starches, sugars, pectins, beta-glucans. It's stuff that's not fiber, so it's higher digestible type stuff within the, within the rumen. And then the non-structural carbohydrates, basically talking about starch in this case. It just removes the, the pectins, the sugars, and the beta-glucans. Uh-huh. So we do have a question here from Dana. The yep. question is, what percent of feed sample needs to be atypical, so weeds or native grasses, et cetera, before you would recommend using wet cam instead of NIRS? Oh, man, good question. Um, I'd say like if it's 10%, I'd probably I'd probably live with the NIR yet. If it gets a lot higher than that, then I'd I'd probably be tempted to do it wet chemistry. Like I say, in my in my world, I'm getting a lot of the polycrop stuff that I'm doing. I'm doing wet chemistry. Most everything else I am doing NIR, but <clears throat> the odd time I'll get back a sample that I just I just don't believe it, and then I'll I'll have the lab do a a wet chemistry confirmation on it. Eh? Okay. So I, I'd say, yeah, 10, 20%, something that's different weeds or whatever, then I, I'd probably do it wet chemistry. Thank and you. of course, the minerals, I would always do wet chemistry on that sort of thing. There is another question here. And it says, can you speak on how moisture level in silage impacts contamination from Clostridium and Listeria bacteria and what to do if you expect a uh, contamination? Hmm, interesting. I, my, my understanding on the, on the Clostridia thing is it's basically a soil borne thing is what the Clostridia is. So if you um, cut too low and get some dirt or something coming in with the silage, you're setting yourself up for clostridia. Or another one is if you're packing the pit and it's wet and you're getting dirt and stuff on your tires, you're setting yourself up for clostridia. Listeria is listeria kind of gets in in a, in a poor in a poor fermentation. 
So again, moisture wise, too dry, difficult to pack, difficult to get the oxygen out of it, not a very good fermentation process. Then you're setting yourself up for more listeria. On the on the wetter type silages, I actually think that it, it's less of a problem on wetter type stuff. But if you get the butyric acid fermentation going on, it really lowers the energy value of the feed and it really affects the palatability. But the bunk life of it or the stability of it is actually really good. Like it, it, it will not deteriorate from that point, but the, the palatability and the intake on it is actually the problem. Okay, I had a question text to me. The question was, uh, when you're looking at crude protein, and, th and this might be difficult because it depends on looking at cereal silage versus, you know, like just alfalfa grass, but what yeah. are the normal ranges? Just go by like your basic quick five things you look at on a feed analysis. What are the, what are the averages that you're kind of looking for that are within the good you know what i mean like what you're looking for what specifically is on specifically on protein uh protein and then your ndf and tdn just the yeah, basic okay. ones that you really care about looking so, at like a, on a beef herd aspect of things cole's cole's notes version within within alfalfa or grass the younger a forage is the better the forage is okay so basically a, a really good grass will run 20% protein, somewhere around 30 ADF, somewhere around 50 NDF or lower. That's grass cut prior to heading in the vegetative stage. Really good alpha, alpha meaning um, bud stage, 20% protein or higher, 30% ADF or lower, and 40% NDF or lower. And basically, the all them values, the protein goes down and the fiber values go up relative to maturity. The more the mature the plant gets, the lower the protein will be, the higher the fiber values will be. But then, of course, you still have to figure out, what am I feeding that to? Doesn't matter, because obviously volume comes into that equation as well, right? Usually more mature plants, more growth, more volume. So it leans back to what, what are we feeding it to? What are the animals' requirements? Or what kind of combination can we do? Cereals, cereals, it's a little different. In corn, it's a little different. I kind of alluded it to in this sample. Like in corn, if the protein's actually higher, it means that it's a more, more immature plant, but it's going to be lower in energy value because... Corn is not, not a really a protein type forage, right? Corn is an energy forage. Cereal silages for the most part are energy forages. So if the protein's really starting to get up, usually the energy value is not, not quite as good. There is little exceptions to that rule depending on what you're doing in cereals, but corn, corn there really isn't. The more developed the cob is, the higher energy value the forage will be provided it's not too hard and the kernels are going through the animal because <laughs> that'll change it as well. Hey, Jamie, just a bit more of a question here on expanding on the question for the Clostridium and Listeria bacteria. Um, so my understanding as well is with higher moisture, it does increase the risk of Clostridia being present. Is that correct? And do you have like a a bit of a threshold of it, it, dep it depends what cluster you're talking about yeah like okay. the main the main one comes from dirt mm -hmm. but when you when you get the butyric acid fermentation of it's too wet cluster is involved in that as well but like i say the um i i don't think the mold or microtoxins is a big problem in that type of silage because it's actually quite stable it's it's more the end product the butyric acid and the the palatability of the forage and the lack of intake that you get on the forage. Okay. And um, also kind of on that question. So for the ash, ash percent that you have there, um, just with like extra soil that comes in, do oh. you have a... Was there an like ash on this baby? Oh, yeah, there is under minerals. First one. So it's like 2.9. Yeah, I, I can't see it. What does it say? 2.92. So do you yeah, have like so a level that you want to see Basically, Basically, ash is mineral, right? 
So this is a cereal silage. So we would expect the ash content to be fairly low because the mineral content, mainly the calcium, the magnesium, and the phosphorus are fairly low and the potassium. So in this one, you would expect the ash content to be very low. So if I looked at this one and said 3% ash, you kind of add up the other numbers on there. And if they're pretty close, then you know there's, there's not a lot of dirt in the sample. On an alfalfa silage, you know the minerals are a lot higher. So the typical average ash content would be like eight just because of the higher calcium, the higher potassium, like the higher mineral content. So basically, if I looked at this corn silage and it said 7% ash, then I know there's some dirt in there. If I looked at the haylage and it says like 12% ash, then I know there's some dirt in there, right? Do you have a a limit on, well, I guess not a limit, but a kind of a viewpoint on where there's too much soil and then you start to expect that there might be contamination from the bacteria? Well, yeah, you'll see you'll see spots in the silage, right? Like if you if you drill down through a silage pit and you hit a couple of dirt lumps in there, when you take the out of the probe, you know there's probably going to be some issues. Um, then it stems back to well, there could be some issues here. Well, what are the cows telling us? Like if you got some problems going on, then I'm suspicious that this could be related to it. <coughs> if you haven't got any problems going down going on, then I'm, I'm not quite as concerned, eh? And then sus susceptibility of species is different too, right? Like just for example, sheep are way more susceptible to listeria than what, what cattle are. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with intake and rumen size and animal size and all sorts of stuff play into that. Okay, great, thank you. Any more? Thank you, Jamie. Was that all on your end, Caitlin, or did you have any more? Uh, the main was one other one that came up, which is more just on our recording is there's quite a few people who weren't able to log in. So they're just wanting yeah. to know um, the recording and how do they get that? We, if you, uh, if you want to just text me their phone numbers or their emails, I can send it to them when it's available, but it'll also be, we'll post it on our website and on the MD of Greenview YouTube. And then we'll post it like on Facebook and say, this has been posted on our YouTube, go check it out. But for anyone who wasn't able to access, just send me their contact information if that's okay with them. And I can send it directly to them once it's, uh, once it's ready. Excellent. Okay. No, that was all that I got left for the, unless there's more texts, if anybody can hear this more texts, they're wanting to send in to me. Um, oh, I did right now. Okay. Recording. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of people. Yeah. Just requesting the, the recording for not being able to log in. That's about it. Okay. Sounds good. Well, yeah, I don't see any other questions. So thank you, Jamie, so much for presenting and thank you everyone for attending. And I hope you guys all have a really great rest of your night. Thank you. See you later.